Bring your attention to the breath. Notice where you feel it as you breathe in, breathe out. And do you like the way it feels? If you do, keep on breathing that way. If you don't, you can change. This is one of the most important principles in the practice, one that gets overlooked or ignored or denied even. Was it? which is that you have a role in shaping your experience, and the path is learning how to shape it well. So take an active approach. If you're not sure whether the breath is comfortable enough, play with it for a while. You don't put pressure on it, just think longer. See if it grows longer. Think shorter. It'll go shorter. And then compare either. Long breathing and the short breathing feels. Then you can try deeper, more shallow, heavier, lighter, faster, slower. Again, a sense that you really do shape your experience right now. You're already shaping it willy-nilly anyway. In fact, that's the cause of suffering, is that we shape our experience in ignorance. And the path is all about shaping it with knowledge, being very clear about what you're doing and the results that you're getting. And using a quality that the Buddha called ardency, trying to do it well. That was how the Buddha gained awakening himself, and that's how we gain awakening in his footsteps. Mindfulness is to keep this in mind, the fact that you do shape things. Don't forget that. Alertness is to watch what you're doing and the results that you're getting. So you put these three qualities together. Mindfulness, alertness, ardency. Well, it's interesting that when the Buddha lists them in his instructions for mindfulness, he puts ardent first. In other words, keep trying to do it well. And if you're not sure what is well and what's not well, well, you can experiment for a while. This requires bringing a number of qualities into being in the mind, or developing ones that are already there but are not strong enough yet. The Buddha gives a whole list of seven. Establishing mindfulness is the one that's always useful. And then there's a set of three that are useful when the mind is sluggish, so you can give it more energy. And then there are three that are meant to be used when the mind is too energetic, when its energy is frenetic, keeping you from settling down. The three for calming the mind are calm, or tranquility, concentration, and equanimity. Those are the qualities you need to develop when the mind is not willing to settle down. And this is one of the reasons why we work on the breath. You try to calm it down so the mind can let go of some of the tension around any greed, anger, aversion, jealousy, fear, whatever unskillful emotions are keeping the mind from settling down. Because a lot of times the problem is not so much the mental side, but the physical side and aggravates things. When you're angry, you breathe in a way that's irritating, and that, of course, makes you more irritated. When there's fear, you breathe in a way that actually increases your fear, because your body seems to be out of control. So you try to reclaim your breath, become sensitive to how the breath is feeling, and then try to calm it down. Realize that you do have a role in this. You do have some choices. So try to choose to breathe in a way that's going to calm the mind down, soothe the mind, bring it into concentration. As for equanimity, that deals with two things. Any thoughts that come up with regard to the world outside, you want to be equanimous toward them right now. In other words, you don't get involved. Just leave them there. They're not what you want right now. And then as the mind gets deeper and deeper into concentration, you find that there's less you have to do in order to 
urge the concentration on or to strengthen the concentration so your touch here can be more equanimous as well. Just be at peace with what's coming up. But that doesn't mean if things unskillful aren't coming up, you, you're not at peace with them. You basically bring the mind to a point where everything settles down and you can be at peace. But these qualities are not always desirable, because sometimes the mind just gets very sluggish, or it goes into denial. Or you begin drifting off and don't know where you are, and what some of the Forest of Giants call delusion concentration. You're still, everything's quiet, everything's comfortable, but you're not really clear about where you are. You come out, sometimes you even ask yourself, was, was I awake? Was I asleep? That's not what we want here. We want the mind to be alert. For that, you have to use the more active qualities, what the Buddha calls analysis of qualities. In other words, trying to figure out what the mind is doing that's skillful and it's not skillful. Persistence and then rapture. Persistence is when you try to do things really skillfully. It's that quality of ardency again. And then specifically, you learn how to motivate yourself. If you find that you're feeling sluggish, nothing really seems to be working or nothing seems to be getting you up in the morning, you've got to sit there and analyze, okay, what's the problem? For example, right now, if things start getting sluggish in the mind, what can you do to give yourself a little bit more energy? Exactly which part of the body is feeling sluggish, which part of the mind is feeling sluggish? What is it resisting? You want to analyze the problem a bit to see exactly where the pro where it is, what's causing it. This, after all, was how the Buddha learned how to solve the problem of suffering. The unnecessary stress and suffering we add on to our experience. He looked at what he was doing. What am I doing and what are the results I'm getting? Those were the questions he asked. And are the results good? If they're not good, why am I what is the problem? What am I doing that's getting these results and how can I change it? requires that you use some ingenuity, and you keep yourself motivated in this direction. Sometimes in meditation, the thinking you have to do really does involve pep talks. You can either warn yourself about the dangers that come from having an untrained mind, or you can encourage yourself. Think of me. You're showing compassion for yourself as you meditate. You're doing something skillful here. It's good for you. It's good for the people around you. It's good all around. And the more skillful you get at it, the more you will benefit from it, and the more other people will benefit from it as well. Or you can think about the inspiring example of the famous Ajahns of the past, the famous monks and nuns from the Buddha's time. Many of them went through lots of difficulties. Sometimes their difficulties were worse than the ones we have right now, and yet they were able to overcome them and actually become awakened people. So think about that until it gives you a sense of being inspired. So it's not that you're not thinking when you meditate. If you find the mind has a problem and it's out of balance, you've got to think your way to figure out what the problem is. Analyze things. And if you need a pep talk, you give yourself a pep talk. Now, in the beginning, when right effort gets skillful, it does give us rise to a sense of what the Buddha calls bitti in Pali, which is normally translated as rapture. It can also be translated as refreshment. There's a sense of energy in the body, a sense of fullness and well-being. You really do feel refreshed as you sit here, and that gives you the energy you need to raise the level of the mind, gladden the mind, as they say. So those are the activating factors. So part of this is looking at what you've got right here, right now. And if things seem to be in balance, learn how to maintain the balance. If they're not in balance, you've got to either figure out how to calm things down or how to raise the energy of your practice. And 
It's all based on one of the Buddha's discoveries on the night of his awakening, which is that we do play a role in shaping our experience. Sometimes you hear about how past karma shapes your experience. Well, it's not just your past karma. If it were just your past karma, you'd be doomed. You wouldn't be able to do anything about it. Whatever you've done is done, and you just have to sit there and receive the results. But that's not the way the Buddha taught. There are things you're doing right now that shape how you choose out of the field of plants, you might say. And the image he gives is of a field filled with seeds, and some of the seeds are ready to sprout. And it's how you water them. In other words, what you do to them right now is going to determine which seeds are going to sprout right now. So you do have a range of choices. And if you do it in ignorance, there's going to be suffering. If you bring knowledge to it, you figure out this way of focusing on the breath, this way of thinking about the present moment, this way of thinking about what I'm doing, is actually going to lead to good results. Okay, you foster that. So being mindful, meditating, it's not just a matter of just accepting what's there. If you speak in the terms of, accept, of acceptance, it's accepting the fact that you are playing a role in shaping this, so you want to shape it well. Look at the way you perceive the breath. In other words, what labels do you place on the breath? How do you visualize the breath to yourself? John Lee, one of the forest masters, talks about breath energy flowing throughout the body. After all, the air coming in out of the lungs doesn't come in, out and come in and out on its own. There's energy in the body that brings it in and allows it to go out. Where do you feel that flow of energy? That's the breath you want to be in touch with. That kind of breath can permeate the whole body and can permeate with a sense of well-being as you develop skill. So take advantage of the fact that you are shaping your experience. Do it in with knowledge, it becomes a path. The ultimate goal is something that's totally unshaped and unfabricated. But to get there, you've got to learn how to do this well. If it involves calming things down, okay, learn how to breathe in a way that calms you down. Learn how to think about the breath in a way that calms the breath. To soothe the body and take some of the edge of the irritation off of whatever may be going on in the mind. So you can look at it more clearly and figure out which voices in the mind do you want to listen to and which ones do you have to ignore? Which ones do you have to argue with in order to get the mind to be willing to settle down? If your energy level is too low, okay, what can you do to bring it back up? Analyze the problem. and speak to yourself in whatever ways are required to motivate you to keep at it, keep at it, realizing this really is important. This is the way you get out of the suffering that you're otherwise causing yourself. and A lot of that suffering often spills over into other people as well. So what can you do to put an end to that? This is the only way, training the mind. That too is one of the Buddha's important discoveries, is that you shape your experience from the inside. If there's something that could be cured, say, by a chemical from outside or by somebody else coming and help you, that would be one thing. But the fact is that you're suffering from your own lack of skill, and the only way to solve it is to develop your skills. We get help from outside in terms of advice, but the actual work is something you have to do yourself. Unfortunately, the mind is capable of doing that. It can be clear about what it's doing and the results about what it's doing. But to develop that clarity, you really do have to master these skills of concentration. So the mind can be in its balanced, still, solid place here in the present moment and see things for what they are, see potentials for where they are. So you can develop the good potentials and learn how to starve the bad potentials so they don't take over.
when you take responsibility for your actions and take responsibility for your experience, that's when there's hope. <laughs>